Welcome back to Create Craft Costume, where we think creating or crafting is as close to magic as we're going to get. Today's video is all about creating your own DIY fishing pole travel case. Typically, I've seen these made with PVC pipe, and one of the things that makes ours different is the use of a rain gutter downspout instead. The benefits of our design are that it is completely portable, it is lightweight, it's breathable so you won't get any mold, it's washable, and your pole is doubly protected. So if this interests you, keep on watching and let's get, get sewing. sewing. Hello, today we're going to show you how to make a do-it-yourself fishing rod travel case. It fits together quite like a puzzle. What you need, obviously, is your fishing pole disassembled. That will fit into the inner case, which we're going to sew pockets for each individual piece of the rod. Then that is going to go into a piece of rain gutter downspout. We've cut the downspout slightly longer than the disassembled fishing pole. We've secured the one end with some packing foam and duct tape. The other end will remain open. That's where the fishing rod in the case will be slipped into. And the last piece of the puzzle is to make the outer case that all of these pieces fit into. Don't worry about this strap that it doesn't match. We'll, we will address that as we're making this. We are starting on the inner case first, which is the case that you are gonna slip the pieces of your fishing pole into. And we are using this brown fabric from Walmart. No, your eyes are not playing tricks on you. The first fabric was black, but we didn't have enough. Speaking of enough, you need two yards. So pro tip, these packages from Walmart are great if you have those. However, you do want to keep the tightness of your weave in mind when creating this case. With this light, you can see that the white fabric on the left has a tighter weave. That's why you don't see the hand as well, versus our fabric on the right is a little bit more see-through. You also don't need a photo light to do this. You can do this with any fabric holding it up to a light in your own house. And this doesn't mean that a lighter weave fabric isn't usable. It means that you want to make sure that you have enough structure in your case to support the fishing pole. So we are going to turn it into a double thickness just because the weave is looser. If you have a tighter weave, you might want to do a single thickness. Here we have our two yards of fabric. Also note that we folded it selvage to selvage and we squared up the sides. So now we have our two full yards and it's a double thickness. You might be wondering, why do I need this much? And the reason is because we're essentially making a giant envelope. We're gonna take the right side of the fabric and that's gonna be the longest piece because that's gonna be the bottom of our envelope. And we need to fold it up so that it will cover all four of the poles. Then the left side is gonna be the shorter side because that will be the top that encloses it. Now, we needed the two yards for the length, but we do not need 45 inches in width. So now we need to determine how much we're gonna cut off the width so that this case can be as light as possible. So the next step for our giant envelope is to make long pockets for each piece of our fishing pole. But what size? Good question, that depends on your rod. So you need to measure each piece at the very widest part. Make sure you remember that particularly on the handle, it's round. So you have to give it a lot of ease to cover that round. So for this one, the handle part measures an inch and a quarter. To get it to go all the way around the handle and the grip that's further up, we're going to make a four inch pocket. Now the second piece measures two and a half inches. Now, unlike the first piece, which is an inch and a quarter round, this is two and a half inches, but it's an oval. So it will need the same amount of fabric, a four inch pocket, as the one that's round because it's a flatter oval as opposed to a round one. On the next piece, it's an inch and three quarters, so that's going to be a three inch pocket. And the tiny one only measures three quarter of an inch, so we're going to have that be a two inch pocket. So now we are going to end up with a four inch pocket, another four inch pocket, a three inch pocket, and a two inch pocket. So far we have determined how wide each of the four pockets needs to be, 
but that does not take into account the gap in between the pockets and the gap on the side of the inner case. So we are going to add three quarters of an inch on each side and we're gonna add half an inch in between each pocket to give it some room to roll. You can determine how wide you want each of these, but based on our math, we are gonna make the width of our two yards of fabric 17 inches. So the goal here is to get a piece of fabric two yards long and 17 inches wide. You are probably thinking, I'll just cut from the fold. You could do that. However, in this situation, I want a seam on both sides of this case for stability and strength. So we are not going to use the fold. As you know, I don't like to use selvages. So we are cutting off the selvage and measuring from that end 17 inches. Now, this piece, two yards, is obviously longer than my board. So I am going to fold that up to where I can measure from one to 17 inches on my board and see 17 mark on either side. That way I will get it nice and straight. Did you know that you could fold fabric and cut it? Cause that was like a new phenomenon for me. All right, so we have two pieces of fabric, two yards long and 17 inches wide. Now the fun begins to make this case for the inner case for your fishing rod. So if your fabric has a right side and a wrong side, you are definitely going to want to put right sides together. Ours does not, so it doesn't really matter. But if yours does, this is a time when right sides go together. You're going to start on the long edge, you're going to sew down the one long side across the bottom of 17 inches and back up the other side. So you're essentially making a great big pocket. Now there's no need to finish the seams because we are going to turn it right side out. You will also notice that I did not clip the corners down at the bottom of this pocket. I want that additional bulk down there for the strength in the corners. This is not about a smooth corner. This is about strength. So I do not clip the corners. Now we're going to iron this and ironing does take time. Especially on two yards. <laughs> it Just does. Saying. It does. This was four minutes of footage. Don't be fooled. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm going to digress a little bit. My teacher always taught me that ironing takes time, but it is important. Ashley gave me a pin a while ago that said press to impress. And that's very true, I love to iron. So this is a chance that you can use your sleeve board if you have one to press those seams flat. Not everyone has the sleeve board and it is not a requirement for sewing. How many of you didn't know what that was? <laughs> <laughs> Me. It's not important, it's not necessary. It just makes it a little bit easier. However, the other way to do that is use the rolling method and you will just lay your fabric, your piece down, and as you try and press that seam, roll it a little bit to where that's, the seam is actually at the very top edge. It just makes it a lot easier. You'll need to use some steam or a spritz bottle to put a little dampness on it. But if you just roll the seam back and then roll it forward towards the edge, it's a very old fashioned way of pressing, but you will get a sharper edge on those seams. So give it a try. And it will make making the fishing pole pockets a lot easier later. It will, it will. So now we're going to talk about what has been and can be a dangerous method. I am pulling out these corners with a pin. I don't like that. No, and normally I would not do that because it is very easy to pull the corner out, which is not what you want. However, the reason I'm doing it this way is because we did not clip those corners so there's nothing to pull out. So I can get in there with a pin and gently pull that corner out. Again, if it were clipped, I would not do this. It is a very dangerous way to pull out a corner. You can also still, of course, use the tools you might already be using, like a chopstick or something like right. that. Which Absolutely. is what I feel more comfortable with. Absolutely. So just FYI on why I'm using a pin here. Okay, now that it's all pressed, we are going to form the pockets for the rods. The length of the pockets is determined by the longest piece of your fishing pole. Ours is 28 inches. So we lined it up here, folded the fabric up 28 inches. I would like the poles to poke out just a little bit at the top so they're easy to get in and out. 
then you're going to sew both side seams first. The first seam is from top to bottom, very close to the edge, and then a second seam, again, top to bottom at three quarters of an inch. So to be clear, you're sewing four seams, two on each side. Correct. And she busted out the clips, which is so rare. <laughs> so this is a monumentous occasion. I'm, I'm joining this century on the clips. <laughs> So here we are just finishing that first row of stitching. Notice we are not going along the bottom. That is not necessary. Once we finish the first line close to the edge, we're going back up and sewing the second row of stitching three quarters inch from the edge. And we will do that on both, both sides. sides, top to bottom. Another reason for the two rows of stitching is that it gives you a nice stiff edge to start rolling that fishing pole up to fit into the case without the additional weight or bulk of adding interfacing. So now we're going to do the exact same thing, two rows of stitching on the other side. Now, if you can sew from top to bottom with just sliding it over and having the fabric be on the right side of the needle, more power to you. My brain does not do that. I can't do that. So I turn it over and sew on the, on the back side of the case. Again, from top to bottom. And again, one first stitching row right next to the edge, the other one three quarters of an inch in. So why is it important to go top to bottom? The reason it's important to go top to bottom is because you want to sew in the same direction so the fabric doesn't shift diagonally as you're sewing from bottom to top on the other side. Okay, so here we go to mark the four pockets for our fishing rod. We are going to start our measuring from the second stitching line, the ones at three quarter inch in from the edge. And the first pocket we're going to do is for the largest piece of the fishing rod, which is the four inch pocket. So we're going to measure our four inches from that second line, and we are going to mark that with some chalk. Okay, two little things while we're talking about the marking. We are marking this with a very heavy chalk line. That is so you can really see it on camera. You do not need to use this heavy line or you can mark it any way you wish. Notice I am not marking the second stitching line for the space in between the two pockets. I'm just going to eyeball it with the width of my presser foot so it's a half inch from that first stitching line. And speaking of eyeballing, for the next three pockets, we are going to measure this as accurately as we can with the width of the pockets and the space in between. However, if you tend to be off a little bit, an eighth of an inch or a quarter inch width can happen to the best of us, it's going to be okay because that last pocket for the teeny tiny rod does not need a full two inches. So you've got some wiggle room there for your sewing and measuring. So here I am sewing down that chalk line. When you get to the end, you're going to sew across three to five stitches, depending on the stitch length you're using, and then back up to the top using your presser foot as the width or eyeballing it that half inch. At the end, you should have two clear stitch lines as shown here. Exactly. And now take some time to celebrate by seeing if your fishing rod should fit smoothly in the beginning of your case. If it doesn't, Unpicking is a thing, but if you are ready to go, we now have to make three more pockets using the same method. And that method is making sure you're measuring from the last stitch line and using your predetermined measurements. So ours is another four inch pocket, a three inch pocket, and then a two inch pocket. And there are two ways you can do this. You could mark all of them up front like you see us doing here, but don't forget to leave the space for the half inch gap in between each pocket because we don't have that stitch line to measure yet. So just make sure you're using that, that imaginary stitch line as your guide. Or you can measure and sew and then measure and sew so you don't have to do the half inch math in between. But then other than that, the process is the same. You're gonna take them to the sewing machine, uh, sew up one side, about five stitches over, sew back down until all of your four pockets look like this. Don't worry, the chalk comes off, but that is a precaution for if you do decide to mark all of them at once. You just get more chalk on your project. Now's the fun part where we get to check our work by seeing if all four pole pieces fit in their designated pockets. Say that five times fast. And we get to roll it up. 
we should have that extra ease built in there and if everything rolls up smoothly it's time to make our flap we are almost there and our next step is finishing the flap as well as adding our velcro closures but the first thing we need to determine is how long we want our flap to be our goal is to have less bulk inside the rain gutter downspout so we think that this is too long and we're going to use the very scientific method of pulling it down seeing where we think it should stop and cutting off the top once you have cut off that top you are going to take it to the sewing machine and hem it before marking where we're going to add our velcro the standard way to hem something is to turn the raw edge up a little bit and then turn up the hem again so that raw edge is enclosed you could certainly do that right here no problem but since there are four layers of fabric here i'm going to turn the raw edge up once sew down along that line to secure that then I'm going to turn it over again and top stitch it close to that folded edge. Now, even the best of us, when you get to the end, sometimes it overlaps a little bit and sticks out at the end of that hem. On this one, it's doing that. I'm just going to turn that under at the diagonal and then finish that hem. That way it's tucked up nice and secure. And by turn under, you should see a right triangle. If you turn it under and have a right triangle tucked under there, you're gonna have a nice flat edge. Exactly, yes. Well said. Okay, using the sew on Velcro, I'm going to clip it the length I want and then determine where I want the placement to be. I always put the coarse side or the bumpy side of the Velcro facing up and the furry or the soft side facing down. I'm using the clips to secure the Velcro in place because pinning it is very difficult to pin through the Velcro. So I use the, the clips and then to check my placement I'm going to flip the one side back to make sure they're lined up correctly without attaching the two Velcro pieces together. This way you can make that sure that it's exactly where you want it to be. Which is so much easier than measuring which is where my brain went to. <laughs> it is. Okay, now sewing on the Velcro. The coarse side is the tricky part because those coarse fibers tend to break your thread. So if you look at the side of the Velcro, you can see a little space there where there is no Velcro. And that little edge is where you're going to want to try and sew. I'm also going to recommend that you use a very a small stitch, at least a two. A lot of people like to use a longer stitch because it's hard to sew through. That's also easier to break. So use a smaller stitch, sew along that edge down. Now when you sew along the bottom of the, the Velcro, you have to sew through those coarse fibers. Sew back and forth along there at least twice, so probably over, back, and over again, and then sew up the other side, and then same thing at the top of the Velcro, and you've got the coarse sides secure. Now the fluffy side is no problem because those are no there's nothing there to cut your thread, so you can just sew around that and you're done. So now that we have the inner case done, we're going to start with the last piece of the puzzle, which is the cover for the downspout, the outer case. So what we're going to do is determine how much fabric we need. We cut our downspout about three inches longer than the pole. Here I have a piece of 45 inch wide fabric laying the downspout in the middle of it. You've got a little at the bottom because you're going to make a box at the bottom for the, the downspout to sit in. You also are going to have some fabric at the top for the casing to cinch it up at the top. Okay, now we know that 45 inches is going to be long enough for the case. We need to determine how wide it is. So we're going to measure around that downspout. It measures 10 inches, but we need a seam allowance. So we're adding half an inch twice for each side of the seam allowance, so we're adding another inch, which makes that 11 inches. That's how much fabric it's going to take to go around this case. Now you want it to be snug. We are not including ease. Unlike the first case, because if you didn't realize, you're never supposed to see this downspout again. Once you fit that case around it, they are permanent fixtures of each other. So make sure it is tight when going in. Right. That is also why the 
foam and the duct tape that we used at the bottom is going to work so well. The foam is breathable, has breathability, so the water can get through that, and the snug case is going to keep that duct tape in place. So what I'm doing here is squaring up those edges so it will be perfectly straight on both sides. Now the fabric that we're using here is a heavier fabric. It's a canvas or duck fabric. That is because it needs to be stronger to carry the whole thing, unlike the inner case, which we wanted as lightweight as possible. But don't forget breathability. This is also why you don't want a lining, is you want it to be able to be used outdoors and dry quickly. Now that we've cut our 11 by 45 inch piece of fabric, we need to prepare this piece for the interfacing to support the strap on the outside. So here, we're just eyeballing where we think both ends of the strap should be, and we're marking it with a pin on each side on the right side of the fabric. However, the interfacing is going to go on the wrong side. So we're turning this over and using that pin as a guide to see where we're gonna cut and adhere our interfacing to. So here we're making marks where we want to apply the squares of interfacing on the wrong side. The strap is going to be sewn on the right side, but the interfacing on the inside will provide that support for the tension the strap is going to have. We're just going to use a regular iron-on interfacing. You do not want it across the whole bag. Just cut maybe some five inch squares. Once they're cut, you're gonna take that over to the ironing board to adhere it. Make sure the bumpy side is down. And fun fact, if you spritz it, it will actually give you a tighter seal. So if you aren't using fabrics that shouldn't get wet, this is a great way to strengthen your interfacing. Now that the fabric is ready, we need to prepare the strap. Here you can see this red webbing doesn't match, but we're gonna cover it in fabric. We also pieced this webbing together. So don't think you always have to go out and buy new material, but you wanna make sure when you're measuring the length that you treat it like one of those foldable camping chairs. You don't want it to sit flat against the bag. You wanna be able to hook your shoulder in there, otherwise it's gonna be very uncomfortable to carry. We measured this by hooking a measuring tape around this gentleman's shoulder and we determined that he needed about 34 inches. Now the fabric is not necessary, you could sew it on just like this, but you do need to singe your edges. That keeps this piece from fraying as you see here and then you are ready to attach the fabric if you choose so. Now we're gonna cut the fabric to cover this webbing. This webbing is an inch and a half wide, which means I need to double it to get all the way around plus add an inch for seam allowance. So this strip of fabric needs to be four inches wide. Once you have cut your four inch strip, logic would suggest that you create a tube and turn it inside out. However, for this strap, we are doing something different. We are going to turn one edge over and then we are going to fold the other side under and meet in the middle so that we can top stitch down the webbing directly. If we used the tube method, the webbing would be able to move and we don't want that. We wanna sew the fabric directly to the webbing so that it gives the strap more stability. Plus, this is a massive time-saving technique, so who doesn't like that? Speaking of time-saving, if you press that one raw edge down before pinning and taking it over to the sewing machine, it will make matching up those stripes and the overall experience a lot easier. So that's what we're doing here before pinning the stripes together. Now, you may look at this and think it's too long. It's not. This webbing does not fold well. So we specifically don't want to sew this directly to the interfacing. Instead, we're going to enclose this and we're going to use the part at the end that's just fabric and we're going to sew that directly onto the interfacing piece. But before we do that, we need to match up these stripes because they absolutely have to match. And if you don't want to choose stripes, that's fine, but this would also be a really good time to practice that. So we're gonna pin this really well before heading to the sewing machine and top stitching it down. Once it is pinned, you are gonna take that over to the sewing machine and sew from top to bottom, making sure your stripes are still in place. Now you only need about three inches of fabric on each side of the webbing. So if there's more on one side than another, we're just gonna even this up here before finishing off the ends. Now before you finish this raw edge, there is a trick to it. Normally you would think you would turn it to the wrong side, 
but because of how we are sewing the strap on, you want to turn it to the right side or the side without the seam because we are gonna be sewing the strap on like this. This will ensure that all of that edge is enclosed and you won't see any of it. So fold that raw edge to the side without the seam, take it to the sewing machine and do a zigzag stitch. It doesn't need to be pretty because it's hidden. Once you've done it on both ends, your strap is ready. Now it's time to attach our strap to the front of the bag. First step is marking the middle of those interfacing squares so that you know where to pin the straps. In order to pin it correctly, you want to take that raw edge and put it to the right side of the fabric. That way when you sew, it's going to be enclosed. In order to attach both of these straps, you're going to make about a one inch square and then sew an X through each of those squares. That will help with the shifting and support the weight of the bag. And once you have attached the other side, your handle is ready. All we need to do is fold right sides together to put together the first seam of our bag. We're gonna match up those stripes before taking it over to the sewing machine and sewing one straight half inch seam down. Don't forget to finish off that seam either through serging or here you see us zigzagging it. And by the end, you should have a giant tube with your handle in the middle. Now you get to close up the bottom. Yay. Okay, we are now going to make the base for our case, and that involves making a box that the downspout will fit down into. This is the same process that we used in our fabric gift bag tutorial. If you've seen that, this will be a review. If not, here's what to do. You're going to close up the bottom of this tube, and it's very important that the center seam be in the center where you're sewing right now. That has to be in the middle because on the other side of the tube, that's where the handle is. The strap is in the middle there. So make sure you open that out flat and that center seam is in the center of where you're going to sew. Now you're going to just do two rows of stitching along the bottom quite close together for additional strength. So now we need to figure out how to, wide to make the box. The first thing we're going to do is measure the base of the downspout. It is three inches wide. So that's how wide our box need to be. So we are going to flatten out that seam that we just sewed and measure across that from point to point to determine where our three inch box is going to fit. So we're measuring across what we just sewed from point to point, five inches. Our box only needs to be three inches. So what we're trying to do is we are trying to make this have four corners. In order to do that, we're going to sew across the points, one inch down from the point on either side. That will turn this straight line into a box. So here I've laid that point on my cutting board at the one inch mark, and then I'm marking down a full one inch. I've got stripes here that I can follow, but you might not. So you want to make sure you mark that with chalk. The trick here is to make sure that fabric is laying flat so you have an actual square box. Double check, triple check to make sure you don't have any tucks or folds before you sew across that. Okay, it is time to turn it right side out. You can use a dowel, a yardstick, whatever you have handy that is not sharp to turn this because you don't want to push through the end of the box. So turn it on, slide it on out, and there is our box at the end. And everyone's natural instinct is gonna be, does it fit? So you can put the, the gutter downspout in right now knowing we haven't finished at the top yet. So it's gonna be a tight fit in, and then you do have to take it out to do the casing. You don't wanna be dealing with that while you're finishing the top. But it's so cool, it's look really, at it! It's really fun to see your great looking box. And so remember, it should fit tightly, because there was a moment when we were putting this on, I was like, oh my gosh, we messed up. It should fit tight, because you shouldn't have to take that out again. Exactly. So that was fun. Now we're going to make the casing. So we're taking the downspout out. We are going to line up the bottom of the downspout with the bottom of the outer case, outer covering, and figure out how much we need to do at the top. Now, because we have a three inch box, we need to add three inches at the top so we can cinch that up 
and then on top of the three inches we need our inch and a half casing. So we're going to cut this at six inches which will give us the casing and the seam allowance for the casing. So my profound apologies to all of you. I got ahead of myself and told you to finish off that seam which was good advice except for the fact that I forgot about the casing for the drawstring. So in order to have a place for the drawstring to go through, we're going to open up that seam allowance flat and sew down the edges of the seam allowance in a big U, down one side, across the bottom of the seam, and up the other side. So when we open that seam for the drawstring, those raw edges will not get in the way. You're going to sew down about three and a half inches from the top, across the seam, and back up. You're going to make a great big U which will secure that seam allowance so you can open up the top side of the seam to thread your drawstring through. So the first thing we're going to do is turn under the top of that case and sew around that about a half an inch to just finish the edge at the top of the casing. So now you're going to finish the casing. You're going to turn that to the inside an inch and a half and sew around the bottom edge of that casing. Now this should be below the U that you just made. So stay right at the sewing machine. Just move your presser foot up to about a half an inch from the top edge and sew around it again. That will be the top edge of your casing. So it should be another giant tube that you're going to thread the cord through. Right. So to get the cording in the casing, you need to open up that seam allowance between your two stitching lines on the outside only. Do not go through to the seam on the inside. Leave that sewn shut. And just a few stitches right there. Then I use a safety pin to thread the cording through. There are fancy gizmos, I just don't have one. But on your silk cord, if you're using that like I am, it has a tendency to slip through the loop in the safety pin if you just do a little easy knot. So I usually secure it with a slip knot. So with your safety pin, you're just going to insert that and thread that all the way around the case. Pull it out the other side, remove the pin. I always like to singe these ends because they do have a tendency to fray. And then I like to tie the two ends together so they don't slip inside the casing. Now the last trick is to put the case back inside the outer cover. All right, now you're just going to slide your case inside this outer covering. It will be a little tighter this time to get started because of the casing, but that just means you did it perfectly and it's coming together. And you never have to take it out again. <laughs> exactly. In fact, you're going to tuck that top right back in and you are done. Mm -hmm. So here is our lovely recipient slash avid fisherman, which is why we wanted him to demonstrate how to properly use it far better than I could. I made several of these a few years ago for some friends and neighbors. He was one of them. And then he called and asked if I would make one for his son because he loved his and it is wearing very well. So with that endorsement, we wanted to share this with you and remind you that this could be a great gift for the fishing enthusiast in your life as well. And don't forget, if you wanted to learn more about making different bags and the bottom of that box bag method, we have our full gift bag tutorial linked below. If you would like to help out the channel with purchasing some supplies from our Amazon store, that gives us a small amount of money. So it is an affiliate link, but you can get some of the supplies for this project and you can help support this channel. So, a fishing we will go, a fishing we will go, and we will see you in the next video.